Hi everyone, welcome back to Boarding School with Brandy. I'm Brandy, and today I'm going to be teaching you Titanic the Game. This is a game for two to five players where players are trying to get the most points by saving passengers, completing objectives, playing star cards, and escaping the ship, of course. After nine rounds, the surviving player with the most points wins. To set up, place the board in the middle of the table where everyone can reach. It's a pretty huge board because the Titanic was a huge ship. Next, you wanna take the four top deck tiles. They all have a number on them. Just put them in the matching numbered top deck spot. Next, you wanna grab the room tiles. You need to sort these out by the number on the back. There's going to be four of each row, 900 being the top row and 100 being the bottom row. Now, if you wanna play a historically accurate game, you are going to want to place the tiles on the room that matches the number on the back exactly. So this one says 900A. I would wanna place that on the 900A spot. Likewise, I would wanna place 900B on 900B and so on, down the entire row of 900s, all the way down to 100D. But if you wanna add a little variety to your game, then you can shuffle up each stack of tiles and place them randomly on the row that they are assigned to. You couldn't just shuffle up all of the tiles together because each row of tiles is a slightly different size than the row above and below it. So you have to keep the stacks of tiles in their individual rows. Place all of your tiles out on the rows that they are assigned. The next step is to place out the lifeboat. You're gonna have two different types of lifeboats. There are going to be two that have player counts on them. Set those to the side for now. What we wanna focus on are the ones that don't have player count. They're all different shapes and sizes and they're going to match up to these lifeboat shaped spots on the sides of the board. The odds go on the right, the evens go on the left, lowest number on the bottom, highest number at the top. Just place them in their assigned spots on each side of the board. Next, grab the collapsible lifeboats that you set aside and grab the one that suits your player count. We're setting up for a two player game today, so we're gonna grab the one that says two to three players and you're going to place that next to top deck number four in the final spot. This is where you need to get to to escape. You might also get the door, but despite what we all think, only one person can survive on the door. Everyone else is going to have to get into a lifeboat or they're going to perish. The next thing we're going to do is put out the passenger meeples. These guys are so adorable. They are just the cutest little meeples. Not the cutest, but I mean, they're up there. And what we want to do is put them on the matching colored spaces for each one. So I have some gray in my hand. I'm just gonna take the whole stack of gray and put all the gray ones out on matching gray spaces. You shouldn't have any gray passengers left when you're done. These are limited on purpose. If you enter a room and there's not a physical passenger in that room, there's not one available to grab. You shouldn't ever have any that aren't on the board throughout the game. If they die because they aren't rescued in time, they go over here to the iceberg because they might count towards in-game scoring. Next, you wanna grab the next color and place all of those out and then you'll do the third color until all of your passenger meeples are out. You might be wondering why they are different colors, and the reason is they are worth different amounts of points. Red is worth the most points, and you'll find most of them on the bottom tiles, and they're worth more points because it's considered more heroic to rescue them. They're harder to get to lifeboats because they're in levels that are going to flood faster, therefore they are going to perish sooner. The green passengers are worth the least, because they are considered easier to rescue. They're found on most of the upper levels, so they're not going to drown in a flood as fast, and you aren't going to have to wade through as many flooded rooms to pick them up and scoop them onto the bigger lifeboats that are up at the top.
That one just tried to jump ship early. He wasn't even gonna go to work today. Next, we'll want to create decks of cards. These are the star cards. There are four different types of them. You'll want to sort them by the different icon on the back and then shuffle each deck individually. Set all four decks near the board. And I'll talk more about these during the star phase. Next, we're going to create the flood deck. Since we're setting up for a two player game, we are going to take out any cards that say no flood. These are for five players only. Shuffle those up and then put that shuffle deck near the board as well. Next, we're gonna create the general supply. We are going to put the lifesaver tokens nearby, the star tokens as well, the action cubes, We also need to grab the heart of the ocean, put that nearby, and grab the door. The side that's going to be face up is going to be determined upon player count. In a game with three to five players, you are safe if you have the door token. In a two player game, you get a star token when you get it, but you still have to make it to the collapsible boat. So we're gonna put that two player side up near the board. Next, we're gonna grab the flood markers I like to just put these at the bottom of the board. These are going to signify the rows that have been flooded and anything that is on or below the rows that these are on is lost to sea. Items will go back to the general supply and any passengers that haven't been rescued will go to the iceberg. Next, each player gets their reference card. It's double-sided. It tells you about each phase of your turn and it also tells you about the different star cards. Next, each player decides what character they want to be and takes that player's standy. I'm going to be Rose and the second player will be Jack because who am I to argue with history? You'll want to grab the matching player mat for those players. Players also get their matching character tile and the character tile has your special ability on it. Place that in the player mat, active side up. You also grab the score trackers. They're double-sided. The other side says 35 points if you happen to make it to the end of the track, but place them character side up in the empty spot. Next, each player gets a private objective. These are dealt randomly, so shuffle them up and deal each player one. You wanna keep this secret from other players, but you will notice that each private objective card has a private objective for each player. You only need to focus on yours. Just flip that bad boy upside down and slide it in the slot that says in-game scoring. Next, we need to place action cubes in our player mat. The number of action cubes you start with is determined upon player count. We're playing a two player game, so we're each going to get four. The more players there are, the less cubes that you get. In a five player game, you only start with one. Grab those action cubes from the supply and put them on the available side of your action slots. The person who was most recently on a boat is first player. And then play just goes around the table in clockwise order. So to complete setup, the first player takes their standee and places it in a room on one of the 100 level tiles. Once they've placed their standee in a room, they also get to pick up one of the items that are in that room. So before we decide which room we're going to place our standees in, let's take a closer look at how the tiles are laid out and what rooms are considered adjacent to which items. If we take a look at row eight, we'll notice that there are a few different types of tiles. The first tile to the left has two different rooms. But there is no wall. So if you placed your standee on forecastle deck, then you would be adjacent to an action cube, a star token, and a green passenger. If you placed your token on the smoking room, you would also be adjacent to all three of those items. If you move to the grand staircase, all of that is one room. So you would be adjacent to everything that's available in that room. If you move to the third column, you'll notice there's a wall on this tile. So anything that's on the side adjacent to the first class stateroom is not adjacent to the gallery. Likewise, anything in the gallery is not adjacent to the first class stateroom. And this wall makes these rooms not adjacent for moving purposes as well, but we'll talk about that later. If you take a look at the first tile in row seven, this one's also a little different. The first class stateroom does not have a wall between it 
in the purser's office. However, if you were in the first class stateroom, you would not be adjacent to the star token. You're only adjacent to the items that are next to the room that you're in. Likewise, if you were in the purser's office, you would not be adjacent to the green passenger. All that being said, I typically like to go for a lifesaver as quickly as I can to max out my available lifesavers because you can't pick up passengers unless you have a lifesaver available for them. Where would you carry them? So I'm going to put my standee in either the coal bunker or the boiler room. I really like the boiler room because it's adjacent within two spaces to a bunch of red passengers who we discussed are the most valuable. So I'm going to go ahead and pop over to the boiler room. In order to take something that isn't a passenger, you'll want to grab the marker that's included in the box and mark off whatever item that you're going to take on the tile. I'm going to take the lifesaver, so I'm going to mark that off and I'll grab a lifesaver from the supply and put it in an available slot on my player mat. You always want to make sure that you mark off the item that you took from the room. They're limited on purpose, so the next player who enters this room won't be able to get a lifesaver since I already took it. You might also notice that there are only three spots for me to add a lifesaver to my player mat. That's limited on purpose. I can only have five lifesavers max. You start with the two that are provided on your player mat and you can add three by collecting them from rooms as I just did. Once I reach five, I couldn't get another. That works the same for action cubes, which are represented by the blue cubes on the tiles. Once you have five in your action rows, then you cannot take another. You can't hoard them even though you're able to spend them later freeing up spaces. You would have to acquire another action cube after you freed up the space. Jack is going to start in boiler room four and he's going to pick up a green passenger and place that in his first available lifesaver. Once all the standees are out, we're ready to actually play the game. The game lasts nine rounds and on each player's turn, they complete three phases, the action phase, the flood phase, and the star phase. During the actions phase, you have five actions available for you to use as much as you can, depending on how many action cubes you have available. Not all of the actions require you to pay an action cube, but if they do, just move one of your available action cubes over to the used side of your player mat, like that. The actions that are available are move, pick up, save, play star cards, or use your special ability. The first action, moving, costs one action cube, and it allows you to move to one adjacent room. Adjacent is considered up, down, or left to right, and as I mentioned earlier, if there is a wall to the left or right top or bottom of that room, it is not adjacent. If you ran into a wall, like I have here in boiler room two with rows, I cannot use one move action to go over to boiler room three. That would be illegal. I would have to use three move actions and hop up to switchboard platform as one action, then the CO2 evaporation room as my second action, and then my third action would be boiler room three. Another important thing to note when you are moving is it doesn't matter how many standees are in a room. They don't impact each other. As a matter of fact, there's not a ton of player interaction besides the occasional blocking, as in somebody may have taken the resource that you wanted or used up a space on a lifeboat that you were counting on. To move, we would slide our action cube to the used side and I would move my standee one space adjacent. I'm going to move rows up to the switchboard platform and that's my move action. The second available action is pick up. If you don't have space for an item, you can't take it. We've discussed that the action cubes and the lifesavers have a limit of five. You also cannot take more passengers than you have lifesavers for. And once you've taken a passenger, you're committed to them. You cannot get rid of them until you put them on a lifeboat. The only item that you could pick up that doesn't have a limit to how many you can have are the start tokens. Just keep them in a personal supply near your player board. Since I just moved to the switchboard platform, I am going to use my pickup action that's linked to the move action that I just took to pick up this red passenger and place them in my first available lifesaver. The third action available for you to use is save. 
This is the action where you move passengers from your lifesavers to the lifeboats. This action is the one that gets you the most points in the game. You just have to be in a room adjacent to a lifeboat. Spend one action cube by sliding it over to the used side from the available side. And then you load passengers from your lifesavers to the lifeboat. My Rose Standy is currently standing in the large cargo hold after spending two more action cubes to move from the switchboard platform to the luxury cargo hold where she picked up a green passenger and then to the large cargo hold where she picked up a gray passenger and now she's ready to use the third action of saving. So I will slide the available, my last available action cube over to the used side and start loading passengers into this lifeboat. You always load in numerical order. Every single slot available on your lifeboats is numbered. So I would take my first passenger and I always start with the most valuable, meaning red, and you place them on the one spot. I would take my next most valuable passenger, which would be white, and place them in the next available spot. You'll notice that this one has an exciting little icon that shows two. That means I'm gonna score two extra points for placing this meeple on this spot. The last available spot is a blue square. That spot indicates that I could put an action cube here to score three additional points. You have to use an action cube on your available side, and I don't have one available, so I'm not going to be able to take advantage of that. But now I can score the points that I have acquired for saving these passengers. Red maples score you three points, white score two, and green score you one point. So for this action, because I covered up two bonus points, used one red maple and one white maple, I'm going to get seven points. That's two bonus points, two for white and three for red. I'll move my score tracker up, seven points. The last thing you wanna do when you save passengers is check the boat and see if it's full. Our boat is considered full because putting an action cube on it is not required to fill the boat, just filling it with passengers. As soon as the boat is full, it launches. Just push it out to sea like this. They get to watch the chaos unfold from like 15 meters away. The fourth action available to you during the action phase is to play star cards. This action does not cost an action cube and you can do it at any time and play as many as you're able to. The only time that you can't play star cards is immediately after acquiring them on the round that you acquired them. Each one of the star cards you acquire will be different and some of them are going to give you tasks that you need to complete during the game in order to get in-game points or some are going to give you a benefit right away or some ongoing ability. Either way, you don't want to discard any of the star cards that you played because some of them might count towards final scoring. So if you play cards that are going to count towards in-game scoring, put them face down in the in-game scoring section of your player mat with your private objective cards. Any other cards that you play, keep them near your player mat, either face down in a pile that says, I've played this card, or face up so that you can remember to use that ongoing ability. The fifth available action is to use your special ability. You can only use this special ability once per turn and only if you're on the active side. All you do is follow the text on the tile. As Rose, I can draw one star card. I'm gonna take the one with the person on the back. And then I will flip my character tile over to its inactive side. You can read the text on the back to find out how to reactivate this, but all you need to do is go to one of the top deck tiles and then you're able to flip that over and it's available for use again. But remember, once per turn, even if you reactivate it the same turn, you can't use it twice. Once you've finished taking actions, it's time for the flood phase. This phase happens on every player's turn after their actions phase. In a two player game, you will draw two flood cards, but with any other player count, you'll only draw one. To complete the flood phase, just follow these steps in order. Draw the appropriate amount of flood cards. I drew column two flooded and column four flooded. So you will want to flood the bottom tile in whichever column is indicated on this card. Our first card says column two. This is column two where Jack is standing. We will leave him in the room and just put this tile with this card for now. Next, we're also going to flood column four, the lowest tile available in this room. We'll take this tile off and put it with this card as well for now. You always flood the lowest tile in the column. And if you were playing a two player game and you drew 
the same column twice, you would flood the lowest and then the next lowest. Always keep those off to the side for a minute, remembering where you pulled them from. And if there are any passenger meeples on there, keep them on the tile as well. They may be important later in this phase. The third step is to check to see if any rows are now flooded. To be considered flooded, all of the tiles would have to be gone from a row. Multiple rows can be flooded in a single flood phase in a two-player game. If one of your rows was flooded, you would take your flood markers and cover the flooded row. All of the components from that row would be removed, the passengers would be lost to sea and they would be placed on the iceberg, and the components would be placed back in the general supply. Lifeboats will now launch from any rows that are completely flooded, whether they're full or not. You won't have an opportunity to put any more passengers on lifeboats that are gone. The fourth step is to add the components from the tiles you removed during this phase to the rows that were flooded but are still above the flood line. So we removed tile 100B. We still had an action cube and a star token available. We also removed tile 100D. They had an action cube and a star token available as well. Now both of these tiles are removed from the game and you will discard the flood cards near the deck. If you run out of flood cards, you will shuffle the discard pile to form a new deck. The fifth step of the flood phase would be to rescue any players who are stuck below the flood line. If this happens, that player immediately loses three points and then they would float up to the next room above them. They don't get to pick up anything once they arrive to this next room because it's not a normal move action. But if that room isn't flooded and there are two rooms available on the tile, they can pick which room to go to. The third and final phase of a player's turn is the star phase. This is the phase that you can use the star tokens that you acquired throughout your turn or throughout the game to buy star cards. Each star card costs one star token and you can buy as many as you'd like. However, your hand size is limited to three cards throughout the game. You can never go over three. So if you draw a fourth card, you have to immediately discard one. That doesn't go into your plate area. That's discarded and you won't be able to use it. The four types of cards that you might buy during the star phase are location cards. They have an icon that looks like a pin drop. These are going to ask you to play them once you're in a certain room. The next are person cards. They have a person on the back and they provide you a special ability once they're played. The next are item card. They have a diamond on the back. These give you a powerful one-off ability. And the last available type of star cards are scene cards. These ones give you the opportunity to act out a scene and they might give you in-game points or immediate points or some other type of reward, but they're always super fun. After your star phase, it's the next player's turn. They complete all three phases on their turn and play just proceeds clockwise around the table until the end of the ninth round. At the end of the round, at the end of the last person in turn order's turn, you're going to take a look at the score tracker and determine if anybody is really falling behind in the game. The rule book says definitively in last position. And if there's somebody who is really, really lagging behind, then you'll go ahead and give them the heart of the ocean. If you were in possession of the heart of the ocean on your next turn, you're going to have one more action available to you and you'll do this evaluation at the end of every round. The heart of the ocean might never leave the supply if there's a really tight game, or it might stay with one player all game long, or it might pass around to players every single round, or you guys might decide to heck with it. We're not playing with that. We don't do bumpers around here and not use it at all. The first player to make it to 20 points picks up the door token. Like I mentioned earlier, if you're in a three to five player game, you now don't have to make it to the collapsible boat. You are going to escape the Titanic no matter what. But if you're in a two player game, you just grab yourself a star token and be excited that you're in the lead. The game ends after nine rounds. And in order to participate in final scoring, you have to make it to the collapsible boat if you weren't the lucky player who got the door. I still think that two people could have fit on that door. In order to get off the Titanic before it sinks, you need to make it to the collapsible lifeboat if you don't have the door. In order to get onto the collapsible lifeboat, you have to be on top deck four and you have to spend an action cube to hop over to the boat. You also load it in numerical order, just like you load passengers onto the lifeboats. And you might lose points or gain points depending on when you board the boat. In a two player game, the first player to board is going to get four points and the last player to board is going to lose four points but losing four points is better than not scoring at all. Like I mentioned previously, if you're not on the collapsible lifeboat, 
by the time the Titanic sinks at the end of the ninth round and you don't have the door that's going to keep you afloat, you get eliminated. You're lost to sea, like all the passengers on the iceberg. At the end of the ninth round, all of the passengers that you have left on your lifesavers are lost to sea. You can't save them anymore. They're placed on the iceberg. This is still important because it still might affect final scoring for some players. Next, we go ahead and tally final points. You add the points from your star cards that you played for in-game scoring to your current score, as well as any points that you earned on your final objective. The person with the most points wins. If there's a tie, the person who had the least action cubes wins. The game also provides a stack of automation tiles to make a two to three player game a little more exciting, we'll say. It causes a little more chaos, and I'll let you guys explore these on your own, but some of the things that might happen to you with these automation tiles, you might just lose some action cubes that are available on this level for no reason. You might just lose a lifeboat from the game. No star tokens on this level. Nothing happens, that's a nice one. See, excitement. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions about Titanic the game, or if there are any games you want to see me explain how to play. Thanks for watching.